Lord, we're here, and we know you are. Um, we wouldn't be here unless you are. You're the one that brought us here. You've brought us together uniquely for what it, have, what it is that you've prepared today. So as always, uh, I pray that people won't be listening to me, but that they'll be hearing your words, that your spirit will be inside of us, sinking these, the meaning of these words deep, deep, deep into us, so that when the time comes to respond, we know why we're responding and what we're responding to, in Jesus' name. Okay, I've been painting a picture over the last couple of weeks, and, and today I want to finish the picture. Um, we started, and we'll do this, every one of these, these teachings, we'll start with this statement. Please define faith. Okay, I heard one. Anybody else? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, and where's that found? Hebrews 11.1. 1. So here it is in the NIV. You're going to see this again next week, so you might as well learn it. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The picture I've been trying to paint over the last two weeks and hope to finish today is all about being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. And surprise, surprise, God has been amazingly obliging in creating that picture for us. Um, it, it is almost beyond belief that he would do the things he's done. And yet, we're faced with this question following. Given that that's what faith is, so what? Right? I mean, be honest. All my life, even in the bad old days, in, in the, the days of gross legalism that I put myself under, I always claimed to have faith. And then I would run headlong into a wall and say, huh, so what? I mean, what good is this faith stuff? And I asked that question of myself because faith is hard. It's intangible. You can't put your hands on it and control it. It's not like driving your car. Okay? So it, it's, it's not something you can touch. And because of that, we tend to take way too low a view of faith. We kind of presume that faith is for somebody else. Because I've tried it. Notice the way I stated that. I've tried faith and it didn't work. <laughs> you know, only so many bloody noses do you get before you start questioning your beliefs. You now, some of us, it takes until we're 80. Some of us, it takes till you're 90 and a half and everything in between. Okay. But we've got this problem with faith. And so what we need is is a picture of what's going on. So the first week we looked at faith in the Old Testament. There is faith in the Old Testament. And what was its characteristic? Faith in the Old Testament was a human response to God's initiative. And God initiated to Israel through the law and the prophets and through all of the, the history and the poetry and all of that stuff God kept alive this idea of what? Messiah. Nobody could see Messiah. Nobody could sense Messiah. But from the very beginning, immediately after the fall, God says, I'm going to bring Messiah, and he's going to crush the serpent's head. And he keeps that, that idea alive through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and from Jacob to Judah, and Judah through David, and eventually to Jesus. And along the way, he says, I'm going to show the world just what I can do, and I'm going to create this people. I'm going to call them Israel, and they're going to be a stiff-necked people. These aren't going to be people that any one of you would want to lead, and I'm going to convince Moses to lead them, 
and I'm going to lead him and lead them through him. And, and I need to create this people by creating a law for them. And so he created the Mosaic Covenant. But remember, the Mosaic Covenant was not a covenant given to Judah where the line of Jesus came through. It was given to Moses. It was a temporary thing, always intended to be temporary. And yes, when you look at the law and say, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this, I'm going to be saved because of this, you miss the whole point of faith. If you just respond to God and say, yes, God, you are the one, as an Israelite, you are the one who brought me out of Egypt, I'm yours. Things would have been a whole lot different. But instead, they did what humans do. Oh, sure, Lord, we'll keep it. And from the first moment, from the very first moment, they were on their faces in failure. It wasn't the law's fault. But they missed faith. God initiated all this amazing stuff, and we looked at all those prophecies in, in Isaiah. And you could go all over the Old Testament and find them, but we concentrated on Isaiah. Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. Just accept it. Be my people. Quit trying to do it on your own. And then we get to what, is, what are called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which tell the story of Jesus. And, and the nature of faith changed there a little bit. God didn't change, but what he asked of the people changed. Why? Because he wanted a response to his initiative in Jesus, in person. Jesus was there in front of them. And so now you have God in the Old Testament and Jesus in these Gospels. And, and what was the response to Jesus in the Gospels? It was about as positive as the, the Jews' response to God in the Old Testament. You know, we, we really like the miracles, Lord, but how do we know you're God? <laughs> it's just... Oh, we looked at the idea of, of Jesus talking to his disciples primarily and saying, oh, you of little faith. You spend the day with me and watching the multitudes healed or fed or the dead raised or the blind see. And, and so many things that were prophesied are being fulfilled right here in front of you. And after spending the day, we get in the boat and head across the lake and I go to sleep because I'm tired. And a little squall blows up, and you're in a mass panic. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, by the way, stop. And the wind is quiet, and the waves are calm. And then they're amazed all over again. And yet they didn't get it, and they didn't get it, and they didn't get it. And he had to go to the Gentiles to find people who got it. A centurion. Oh, no, Lord, just speak. I know about power. You have the power. I trust you to do what you need to do. Just speak. Or the Syrophoenician woman. I know I'm a dog, Lord. I mean, you Jews tell me that all the time. But even dogs get to eat crumbs from the table. What faith. What faith. And the disciples are just confused. I mean, that's... It's what they were, just confused. So we asked a couple of questions last week, um, asked this question and made a couple of statements. How does this apply to us? How do we see ourselves in the stories of the Old Testament and in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, first of all, we to ourselves or to external factors for strength. We assume we can do it by and for ourselves. This is the, the attitude that says, well, God's over here, and if I get in a pickle, I'll call him. You know, so I'll, I'll do things. I'll live my life, I'll work my job, I'll raise my family, and then something bad happens. I go, oh, Lord! I can do it myself. Well, that leads to all kinds of problems. The other attitude was, we feel that God has abandoned us. 
Therefore, we assume we must do it by and for ourselves. The first one leads directly to the second one. When I think I can do something by myself and I put myself in a giant hole, then I call to God for help and I'm really miffed when he allows me to reap what I've sown. So I accuse him of abandoning me. If you loved me, Lord, you know, because I'm lovable, I am. Just ask me. Um, back in the day when I, I was writing a lot of music and, and I would go to uh, Estes Park, Colorado. They had a music festival at their Christian music festival. And, and uh, one of the first things they always told us in the songwriting class was, just because your mom likes it doesn't make it a good song. Because they'd heard that a million times. Some terrible, I mean, no structure to the melody, terrible lyrics, maybe not even true, and, and they're critiquing it, and, and the person would say, oh, my mom liked it. That's what we do to God. We go out there face first into a wall, and we say, well, Lord, and he doesn't stop the bloody nose. And then we say, well, Lord, I guess you don't love me. I knew it all along, you know, I was just you know, just hedging my bets a little bit, but I knew you didn't love me, and so, you know, I, I've got to do it myself. Israelites did that. The disciples did that. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes did that. But we added a little wrinkle last week. When we trade faith for works, and we... Faith is hard, so I'll substitute works for faith. When that happens, we lose both faith and works. We try to be holy. And we discover that there is no holiness and there, there's no faith. And the problem is it's kind of like an addiction cycle. Because there's some good feelings that come when you're acting holy. Because people will pat you on the head or they'll like you in the neighborhood or all kinds of things. You get better better promotions at, at your job. So there, there's a, a pleasure cycle to this, this legalism. But then there's a pain cycle when you fail, and you can't let anybody know you failed. Because if you do, then they'll know that you're a faker. And you can't be a hypocrite and admit it. It's the whole nature of hypocrisy, right? Where did the word hypocrite come from? The Greek theater was the person who put on a mask and assumed a role. Oh, that's, that's not Bill. That's Hermes. He's playing Hermes today in the, in the play. So he's a hypocrite. He was playing a role, somebody else's role. Well, we, we sign on for these roles, and we think they're for life. Let's see, I've got to be a Baptist. What does it mean to be a Baptist? Okay, you get out the handbook. They do have one, you know. Every denomination has a handbook. And you read what it means, and, and so you, you take on that persona. You wear that mask. And some days it goes well, and some days it goes horribly, but you can never take off the mask, because if you do, somebody's going to point at you. And if, if they love you, they'll say, hey, Richard, your, your, your mask slipped. Put it back on. If they don't love you, they'll go... <laughs> Everybody look at Richard. Huh? And so we're constantly trying to get approval from people and from God, and we've discovered that there's no such thing as faith or works when you're in that position. Everything is a loss. So we learned those things from God in the Old Testament and Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, now we want to look at the letters. Faith explained. So you would think that what I'm going to do is, is a, a whole sequence of verses in Paul's writings or John's writings or, you know, Peter, and we'll, we'll explain faith. And if you've looked in a concordance, there are hundreds of examples of the word faith in the letters. 
There's no way we could talk about faith in the letters. And I was scratching my head going, how am I going to get this into 40 or 45 minutes or an hour and a half or one week? And God said, stop looking at the trees and look at the forest. I think you'll see a pattern here. The world cannot accept the spirit of truth, been referred to in the previous verse, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is talking to the disciples. So the spirit of truth. The disciples knew the spirit of truth, for he lives with you. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus was right there. He was the spirit of truth. And will be in you. Something's going to change. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to leave you, but I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Does this sound like anything that we read in, in Isaiah? Behold, a virgin will conceive and will bear a son. But thou, Bethlehem, though you are least, out of you will come Messiah. And God told Israel over and over and over and over again that Messiah was coming. Jesus tells the disciples, something is coming, the spirit of truth. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That's pretty important. Now, the, the difference between where we are in this part of the story and the Old Testament is that the Old Testament took place over 2,000 years. So people had to wait a long time. And we know, because we're on this side of the event, that this was just going to be a few days, you know, 50 days max from Passover to Pentecost. But still, the disciples didn't know any more about what was coming than did Israel back in the Old Testament. But the promise was made. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. You know, this sounds on the surface sort of like a Dear John letter. You know, it's better if we're just friends. If I go away, if we break up, if we get divorced, if we, you know, whatever. Really, it'll be better. And in your heart of hearts, you're going, who's kidding whom? This is going to hurt. Oh, it's good for you that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Again, Jesus saying, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He's painting a picture. He's setting them up for something. So then he dies, and he's raised, and he's hanging out with the disciples afterwards. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you think all of them were sitting there eating with him and going, well, yeah, we got that? No. No more than we get it when we hear it before we're saved. They're just being human. They're just being what happens when, when you're dead spiritually. Something is tickling your soul, saying, listen to this. And yet you can't get your hands on it. You can't, can't wrap your mind around what Jesus is saying. And yet he's saying it, and, and, and you know that because he's Jesus, that, that something's going to happen. So he tells you to wait told Israel to wait. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. I've told you before, that verse used to scare me to death. I always read it was, you will do witnessing. That's not what it says. You will be my witnesses. Very big difference. What do witnesses do? They witness. So there is an action to it. But you notice you can't witness unless you are a witness. I mean, the last thing I needed as, as a teenager was to be asked to go door to door or whatever witnessing because I wasn't a witness. How could I witness if I wasn't a witness? I miss the whole first part of this. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witness. So the picture is being made a little clearer. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They did that a lot. They all got together because they were afraid to be out in the crowds. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. This would get your attention. It got the attention of the people in the city. Imagine if you were right in the room. A couple of weeks ago, we went to the, the Ranger game on Sunday night. That was the game where they had the bolt of lightning and the thunder. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm watching, and, and you know, we, you could tell the clouds were coming and all of that. And all of a sudden, there's this flash of light. It's the kind of light that if, if you were watching a cartoon, all the people in front of you, would, you would see their skeletons. Whoosh, and then, boom! And it was a whole lot louder than I just did it. I jumped in my seat. 43,000 people went, <gasps> oh, it's an amazing sound in, the, in that stadium. And the whole game, people had been trying to get the wave going. At that moment, 43,000 people, whoa! <laughs> it was amazing to watch. And, and you, I'm sure you saw the, the news coverage. Um, you know, the, the catcher, <laughs> the pitcher's winding up, and he, he's just hoofing it out of there, man. <laughs> the umpire's running, and everybody runs off the field. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent into that room got their attention big time, big time. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is probably the shortest time prophecy ever done in the Bible. Jesus starts during the upper room conversations just before he's killed, and he starts talking about, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send something, the spirit of truth, the comforter, the counselor. And then after he's raised from the dead, he says, just wait a few days, and the Holy Spirit will come. And a few days later, the Holy Spirit came. I mean, this whole thing takes less than two months. But they had to wait. Now, I think the reason it took so long for Jesus to come in the first place is that God needed Israel to finish some things. And because of their hard-heartedness, stiff-necked attitude, it took a long time to get things ready. But as soon as Jesus came back from, from the dead when he was raised, excuse me making it sound like you know, a kid's birthday party, the Holy Spirit is going... Can I go? Can I go? Can I go? Can I go? Is it there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yes! And he comes. This changes everything. You see, God initiated Messiah. That's the only word he used, Messiah. Messiah included a lot of things, but it wasn't Jesus. God initiated Messiah. Messiah finally came. His name was Jesus, and he initiated the Holy Spirit. 
And then the Holy Spirit came and brought it full circle so that God was all and in all. Scratching my head, thinking about how, how to explain this. Let me try this for you. We've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that they are one. It's not three different beings trying to figure out how to work as a committee. They are one. But they have, they have chosen to play these roles for us in order to make things clearer for us because we are stupid. We couldn't figure this out if they wrote it out and handed it to us. They had to demonstrate it. They had to make it real. And I, I picked a triangle because a triangle is inherently a very strong structure. When you're driving home, if you see old-style bridges anywhere on your way home, notice how many triangles are in those bridges. If you see new-style bridges uh, and, you and you can actually stop under the bridge and look up at it, you will see that they've braced it so that there are triangles in the bridges. Uh, it's, so, it's so strong because all of the forces act equally against each other and hold it steady. If you just have two parallel pieces, one can bend. But when you've got that triangle, you have to completely destroy everything to break the triangle. Just within its design parameters, nothing is stronger. So, so we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and the one of them, the Father, worked the most in the Old Testament. And then the Son came, and he worked for only 30 years, 30-some years, much shorter period of time. And then there was an either, even shorter period of time, 50 days, and the Holy Spirit comes. And now the Holy Spirit is here. What was the point of all this? This is the point. All of the power of God is focused on you and me. All the initiative taken by God from Adam and Eve clear through Jesus and from Jesus into the Holy Spirit to right now today has been focused on you and me and the yous and me's that came before us and the yous and me's that will come after us. Here's another way of looking at it. Everything God is has been focused to you and me. So it's not that Paul and John and Peter and James and the writer to the Hebrews explained faith to us. It's that the Holy Spirit explained faith to them. Get it? God the Father explained a bloodline in the Old Testament. Hang in there, folks. I'm going to make sure that whatever happens, this bloodline continues and Messiah will come. And then Jesus came and he said, just hang in there, folks. I'm going to do something that has never been done or imagined before. And he took away sin. And then he was raised. And then he said, wait a little longer and you will see the results of me being raised when the Holy Spirit comes. And then the Holy Spirit comes and says, now are you beginning to see what this faith is? Now are you beginning to see why it makes sense to respond to me, God, and no one else? Don't be God yourselves. Don't try it yourselves. Don't look for it in anybody else. Just look to me. And we have this entire story tied together in God, by God, for God on our behalf. And this is radical stuff. Because if we don't understand this, then the whole New Testament, all those wonderful letters, becomes legalism. Right? 
Anybody can find any little piece of a phrase in the New Testament, just like they could find any little piece of a phrase in the Old Testament, and prove to you that God's going to slap you silly if you mess up. And we're all afraid of that. I don't want to get slapped silly by God. He's strong. Well, I don't want to get hit by any one of you, but think about God. But the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 it's finished. So what are some of the things that the Holy Spirit has been trying to explain to us? Now, we don't have time to go through all of these, and this is just a smattering of, of the number of things that we've looked at in the New Testament before, but put it in this context, in this picture of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit saying, here's what we're going to do to make things real, and we're going to bring this to pass, and we're going to offer this to people. And Satan the whole time is going, hey, hey, you can't do that. And what does God say to Satan? Get behind me. Go away. Well, of course, Satan doesn't go away. One of these days, God's going to say, you're gone. So let's take a look at a few things. The Holy Spirit is explaining to us, in regards to faith, that we have eternal life. 1 John 5.11. You have this testimony in your heart that you have eternal life. The Holy Spirit told you that. I didn't. And if the Holy Spirit tells you that, how dare anybody in my position tell you otherwise? I'm telling you, I, I, I've tried to be patient with people who say that you lose your salvation, but I'm coming to the point that I'm going to have to sit down and shut up. Because I'm... The damage it causes to people. If the Holy Spirit says this, how dare we? We have forgiveness. It's just one of the places where it talks about we have forgiveness. Oh, no. No, you don't have forgiveness. You have to earn it every day. You have to keep a, a, a clean slate. Get behind me, Satan. We have everything needed for life and godliness. Oh, no, 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 you need an accountability group. You need my book. That's what you really need is my book. So because I need to eat, you need my book. It tells you how to have everything you need. You know, what ridiculousness we go through, and yet the Holy Spirit is standing there every day saying, you have this. This is yours. If you belong to me, this is yours. We have every spiritual blessing. Well, again, what do we do? Well, no. No, I, I know I have to do something on my own, and, and you know, there must be something I have to do. I, you know, Lord, I, I must not have everything. So every day of our lives, when we walk outside of faith, we are calling God a liar to his face. He will finish his work in us. Oh, why do we spend all this time on Christian, quote, disciplines? Well, you know, you ought to do this, and you ought to do that, and you ought to do that. Because you do this, all, all, all of it, because you love God. If you loved him, you would keep his commandments, wouldn't you? He will finish his work. That's his job. There is no condemnation. Then why do I feel so condemned? Well, apparently, we've all been listening to the wrong voice. Right? Later in the chapter, what does Paul say? Who is he that condemns? Well, clearly the answer is not God, not Jesus. It must be somebody else. And instead, we put people under condemnation in Christianity. Why is it that Islam has such an easy time recruiting nominal Christians? Because nominal Christians don't have a clue. You know, nominal Christianity is inconsistent. Islam is not. Islam is very consistent. You do this, you do this, you do this, and you get the virgins at the end. 
Sorry, I, that's probably a little pejorative. But, I mean, it's, it's very cut and dried. Well, Christianity, generally, tries to make everything cut and dried. And it all comes down to, I've got to do something or I'm going to catch it. And we don't like that. We don't like that at all. And so we water it down and we get mealy-mouthed about it and, and we wonder why our people wander off with the nearest imam. Now, of course, Islam is a lie because they're not talking about Jesus, but to the average person, who can tell? Who can tell? Nothing can separate us from his love except um, drinking, pornography, and oh, don't get divorced, that D word, you know, the scarlet letter. Either nothing can separate us or we're separated. It's not that something else can separate us, it's that we are separated. And yet the Holy Spirit is saying this to us. No one can snatch us from his hand. Notice this comes from John. We didn't cover John last time, and the reason John is not included with Matthew, Mark, and Luke is because his point of view was so radically different than theirs. He's writing way down at the end of the first century, and Gnosticism is starting to make a mess of things, and he's calling people back to Jesus. And he reports Jesus as saying, because the Holy Spirit brought it back to his remembrance, no one can snatch you from my hand. And we have the gall to say, oh yeah, but you can crawl out on your own. Well, which is it? Is it what the Holy Spirit is telling us, or is it what our minds come up with? It's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's look at some other really positive stuff. We will have trouble in this world. Whoop. Back it up a little bit. He just told us all this wonderful stuff. And the Holy Spirit says, you're going to have trouble in this world. And we will suffer. And we will face hardship. We will face trials. And some of us will be killed. Oops. We don't talk about this stuff much because it's uncomfortable. But what makes this stuff bearable? The previous stuff. If we have learned, if we have come to a conclusion that we have eternal life, that we are forgiven, that God's going to finish what he started, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and hundreds of other verses that I didn't show, then we can look at this stuff when it comes, not before the fact, but when it comes and say, Lord, I still trust you. If you're looking at it before the fact, no. There's no faith and grace before the fact because it hasn't happened. So why spend your life in fear? Isn't that the real problem with what went on, you know, the, the results, the aftermath of what went on in Colorado? I mean, the, the event itself, horrific. We got to see evil on Friday. Right? Nicest looking guy you'd ever want to meet on the street. Look in his eyes when you look at the pictures. You can always tell from the eyes. He's dead inside, folks. He's dead inside. But the real issue is now the country is afraid. And we're going to probably have suggested all manner of ways to keep us from being afraid. And people are going to run to their governments or run to their local police or run someplace and say, save me, save me. Can those people save you? No. They're really good at picking up the pieces afterwards. I mean, it took the police less than 90 seconds to respond to that call. That's a world record. Seriously. But they still couldn't do anything about it. If someone wants you dead, you are dead. You'd better know who you are in Jesus Christ today, this moment, because you never know when something like that's going to happen. There's a million ways that this happens. Some of them are intentionally done by Satan. 
Some of them are caused by accidents because we live in a sinful world. Some are caused by the breakdown of the human genome because we live in a sinful world and bodies go nuts and kill themselves. I mean, there's a million ways to die. There's only one way to live. So don't let the you-will-have-trouble verses in the New Testament throw you off. Just take them for what they are. Okay, we'll have trouble. What do I know today? What do I know at this moment? That I'm saved, I have eternal life, I'm forgiven, nothing will separate me from me, there's no condemnation, and on and on and on. I know those things. And then this stuff is manageable when it happens. Never before, only when it happens. So, in light of this, we've still got some prophecy sitting in front of us. I'm going to show you just a few New Testament verses, but there's all kinds of stuff still hanging fire in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled a bunch of it, but he didn't fulfill it all. There's still things yet to happen. Okay? So the first thing, the Holy Spirit tells us that Jesus is coming back. And then he tells us that Jesus is coming back. And then he tells us that Jesus is coming back. And then he says, guess what? Jesus is coming back. And he's still coming back. See a pattern? A little pattern here? Oh, he's coming back. Well, there is a restatement of this a little later. Jesus is coming soon. Soon soon. Has Jesus come back? No. Do you want him to come back? How do you wait? By faith. See? It's a certainty of those things we hope for. If the Holy Spirit has said, I am saved, that I have eternal life, and the Holy Spirit is telling me the truth, then when the Holy Spirit says, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. I don't have to get all wrapped up in, well, when? Because this is the ultimate. This is what's, what the whole thing is pointing for. I, you know, I show that arrow. It's pointing to you and me. But just, just for the sake of that slide, that was meaningful. But you know that it doesn't stop with you and me. That power goes through the entire world. To all the yous and me's who will respond because Jesus is going to finish this. He finished sin, but he hasn't finished salvation completely. Right? How is the, the Holy Spirit described? As a down payment, as a deposit, but it guarantees what's to come. This is what's to come. Jesus is coming. And then all of this stuff is going to be remade. We've been recreated on the inside. We have yet to be recreated on the outside. And yet it's coming. Now, if we took all of this stuff in the New Testament and just tried to figure out what it means and say, okay, faith applies here this way and here this way, and sometimes faith means belief, and sometimes faith means the faith, as in a set of beliefs. And You know, there's a, a dozen ways, 50 ways, that faith is used. We'd miss the point. The point is that God, in every way that he has revealed himself to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has taken the entire history of humanity and wrapped it up in his purposes and said, watch me. Watch me. I'm going to do things that will blow your mind. Just watch me. Wait for it. Wait for it. And we get to wait. And we get to live life. And we get to, to do all of the things that are prepared for us in advance. these issues. We tend to look to ourselves or external factors for strength. Therefore, 
we assume we can do it by and for ourselves. Here's the answer. There is nothing we can do for ourselves. We must live in the vine. Right? You couldn't tell the Israelites this because it wasn't true yet. They could only wait for Messiah. By faith, waiting for Messiah. Jesus comes. He is Messiah. And even though he tells the, the, the disciples, abide in me, I'm the vine, you're the branches, they still don't get it. They can't get it. Why can't they get it? Because the spirit of truth was with them. It wasn't in them. But now on this side of that whole thing, the disciples and all the rest of us get to know what it means to live in the vine. Why do we keep going back to this idea that we can do something on our own? Don't worry, Lord, I got this one. You know? There's a kid I went to school with who was so nearsighted that it was painful. He loved to play baseball. If there was a, a fly ball ever hit to him, he would stand there, I got it, I got it, I got it, and it would always fall about six inches on the other side of his glove because he couldn't see. But he loved to play baseball. And he caught it once. He was thrilled. The rest of us were shocked. <laughs> Whoa, Lawrence caught one. <laughs> Yay, Lawrence. Oh, you know. That's us. When we're trying to do it on ourselves, we're so nearsighted we miss it every time. And then once in a while we, we accidentally get it right. And that just ruins it. Because, oh, see, I told you I could do it. Okay, you're one for 175,000. <laughs> but I did it. No. Live in the vine. We can't do anything. Sometimes we feel like we've been abandoned, so we must do it by and for ourselves. There is nothing we must do by and for ourselves. Everything necessary was accomplished by Jesus and given to us as the free gift of grace. Are we going to accept that gift? I suppose I could ask the question, when are we going to accept it? In some ways, it's like preaching to the choir here, right? Everybody amens at the right times. But when you think about your, your, your own private life when you're not in this room, how many times do you say, oh, I guess i got to do this? And we forget that we've been given everything. We tend to trade faith for works. We lose both faith and works. It's time for faith, folks. Will we take God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at his word? He is our faith. He is the only source of works worth talking about. It's all or nothing. All or nothing. Either he's done it all or he's done nothing. Either I receive everything that he has done by grace or I reject all of what he's done by sight. Very clear choice. It doesn't make the definition of faith any easier. It's still not tangible. It's still not something I can control. It's still based on the promise of a future event. But God himself has initiated all of this to us. And it's time for us to respond by faith. So, what I've tried to do over the last three weeks is paint a picture. A picture of God's initiative. God's initiative is always perfect. Our response isn't. Next week, I don't know quite how I'm going to do this yet. It's still spinning around in my head. By God's grace, we are going to talk about the rubber meets the road. Right? I've spent three weeks talking about faith and what God has done to initiate reality to us. How do you deal with the freedom part of it? How do we apply faith in our lives? Part of the reason I'm nervous about next week is because I can't claim any special, you know, I'm no better than the rest of you. you know, if, if you wanted to talk about playing the, the keyboard, I've done that, so I can, you know, but faith is different. 
So we will all learn together next week. And we will support each other as the body of Christ is supposed to do. But folks, it really is done. It really is done. We can trust that. We can take that to the bank. Let's pray. Lord, Father and Spirit, you have done everything. You told us you would do it, then you did it, and now you're telling us that you've done it and made it available to us. We have such a hard time on a moment-by-moment -moment basis living with that reality. It's so easy to believe the lies. It's so easy to try to take some responsibility for ourselves. It's so easy to reject you. Thank you for never rejecting us. Thank you for reaching into our lives and saying, you can be mine. Just come to me. Just come to me. So we come to you. We thank you for everything you've done. We thank you for everything you're going to do, and we thank you for your incredible infinite patience as we learn how to walk by faith in Jesus' name.